Welcome to Westwood Media Monthly, the hyper-local show giving you an inside perspective on the people and places that are the fabric of our community. I'm your host, Melinda Garfield, and in this episode, we spoke to Tanya Snyder, clinical supervisor at the Interface Referral Service housed within the Friedman Center for Child and Family Development at William James College. Danielle Sutton, director, and Sarah Baroud, youth services counselor at Youth and Family Services right here in Westwood. With May being Mental Health Awareness Month, it's a perfect time to hear about local mental health resources. Thank, Thank you, you ladies for joining us. Um, so with May being the Mental Health Awareness Month, we felt that it was um, perfect, a perfect time for us to talk about the Interface Referral Service. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could kind of just explain to us what it is and how maybe residents can find it at this point. Sure. So. Um, we have a flyer that's distributed within the community of Westwood. It's available to all Westwood residents for free from the ages of birth all the way through the lifespan. Uh, we have a website as well, and that's um, interface at William James, I believe. Um, so there's, everything is on the flyer in terms of how to find us and where to locate us. But we're available 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. We're a helpline, a resource and referral helpline for access to mental health services that are outpatient. When a caller calls, they receive a live person who answers the phone who is either a licensed mental health professional or a master's or doctoral level student. And we do a brief intake over the phone, collecting information such as insurance, location, availability, issues that are going on for the caller, as well as what type of services they're seeking. We provide them in a confidential code um, so that when we're calling providers later, we're not disclosing their information to multiple people who may not be able to see them mm -hmm. ongoing. Um, what happens after that is they get assigned a lead counselor the lead counselor is in contact within a few days and introduces themselves, makes them aware of where we're at in the process of searching for a provider. Mm -hmm. And that person is responsible for scouring our database. It's over 7,000 providers That's in our great. database. And those are all licensed mental health professionals, which is important. Mm -hmm. um, it's also free for providers to join, which is different than some of the other resources available to the community, which mm -hmm. I think is nice because we have a broader range of providers. It could be a provider that has a small practice who might not be able to afford to join something like Psychology Today, right. but who would be a great provider. We reach out to that <clears throat> provider utilizing that confidential code, and we talk a little bit about what the caller is looking for, what their needs are in terms of insurance availability. And when we have a match, which is that the provider indicates that they can see this client and takes their insurance at the time that they're wishing to be seen, we reach back out to the caller to provide them with that information. We try to have two to three matches, we call them, so that the caller has some voice and choice. We want them to feel like they have the opportunity to look through these providers and, and assess really what would be a good fit for them in terms of location, availability of appointment, or just you know personal things in terms of, you know I, I think I feel more comfortable in this location or with a female provider and I didn't really mm -hmm think about that when I called, but now that I have these options, I'm really leaning towards this option over that option. We then follow up with them in two weeks' time to assess if they've been able to connect with a provider, how they feel about that provider, mm -hmm. how those appointments are going, and we continue to work with them till they feel like they've had a good fit. So sometimes that means following people through several sessions, and sometimes it means sort of scrapping where we started from because maybe they realized they wanted something different or looking mm -hmm. for something new came up. Or sometimes it's also helping people realize that maybe, you know, we talk about the stages of change and that sometimes we thought we were ready to start something and we're just not quite there yet, and mm -hmm. so we're going to hold on to this information until we're ready. So um, based on any of those things, we may continue to follow them through that process or we may decide to close the case, at which point they can always call back at a later time and reopen the case. Okay. And this is an amazing uh, resource for several reasons. You know, prior to bringing Interface to Westwood um, in 2015, 
what would happen and what we'd hear from residents about is that they would have a mental health need. They would either go through their insurance company and get a list, a long list of people who took their insurance and then start calling and people would say, I called 20 providers today and none of them had openings. I called 40 people over the past week and you know, no one was in this area who took my insurance or you know, I only found one person who could see my whole family and that was in Arlington you know, on a Tuesday at 6 p.m. Like, how would we do this? And there was just a lot of frustration. And we know that that's not just in Westwood. That's everywhere. It's a, a universal issue. And Interface is really addressing it. So now um, we can say to a resident of any age, you know, from birth uh, through end of life, so a resident of any age can call Interface, simply say, I'm from Westwood follow the process that Tanya described, and within a very short amount of time, within a couple of weeks, have someone who meets all their criteria. To, it does all of the legwork for them. So there's no more calling multiple providers and not getting anywhere, and that's huge. So what we're hearing from residents, um, and it's already being really well utilized, and we're just hearing a lot of feedback um, over these past couple of years of, you know, oh, it was so amazing to just be able to make one call and then to be able to find people who could actually see us uh, when we needed to be seen um, and who, who met all of our criteria. So we're just so happy uh, that we're able to bring this to the residents of Westwood, that it's available to everyone, um, and that we have an ongoing relationship uh, and subscription with Interface Service. And I do think it's important to say that this is a joint um, you know, venture with the Westwood Public Schools and the Town of Westwood, um, including the Youth and Family Services Department, the Council on Aging, and the Board of Health. So everyone's contributing um, to make sure that the subscription is fulfilled and continues to be funded so that residents have access to the service. And I was going to say, we did a study in mm -hmm. 2012 and 58% of our callers indicated that they had tried to find services on their own right. and met all those different barriers. So right. I think as a licensed mental health counselor, what I think the beauty is is that we remove mm -hmm. all those barriers. Because when you think That's about right. being under any time of stress and mm -hmm. then trying to get things done, it's very hard because your resources are somewhat depleted. Mm -hmm. And if you run into barrier after barrier, it's easy to sort of throw up your hands and say, I, I can't do this anymore. It's just this is now creating a new problem versus right. the problem I already have I'm struggling with. Right. So I think that it's a great resource. We also have a website that I mentioned, and on the website is a mm -hmm. page for Westwood that has links to all of the different community organizations that you mentioned, mm -hmm. but also it has a bunch of guides that residents can access additionally on mm -hmm. how to find a provider, what all the initials behind our names mean, and mm -hmm. Right. How do you determine what might be the best fit for you? Mm -hmm. um, also, information about insurance, how to utilize your insurance. What does it mean to have a copay or a deductible or someone out of network? What does that all mean when you're making calls and trying to figure out if, if you choose to do it your own way or we're calling you and talking mm -hmm. to you? It explains a lot of those pieces that sometimes can be confusing or cumbersome. We also put a lot of up-to-date articles on the website. Right. So there's a, every two weeks there's new articles about mental health issues in general. There's a whole teen resource tab. Yeah. Um, so I think there's just a lot of resources beyond the call center as well that can right. be of a great interest to the rest of the community. Mm -hmm. What a great partnership that we, as residents of Westwood, you know, get to utilize this uh, this service and this referral service. Mm -hmm. Can you actually um, explain maybe some of the areas of support? Um, you know, someone watching this might say, oh, I wonder if, you know, my issue uh, would be something that I would have to, that I could, you know, utilize your resources for. So could you kind of give us an, an idea of what those really areas are? Really, it's the vast sure. range of outpatient mental health services. Okay. So it mm -hmm. can be individual, group, family, therapy, it can be parent coaching, and it runs a gamut for every kind of issue. People will call us to, mm -hmm. to um, find someone who does testing, to treatment, to short-term treatment, longer-term treatment. So I think that um, it really is a gamut of, of issues that people call us for. That's right, and even um, with around substance abuse issues, yeah. people have wondered about that. And what Interface can do is list individual providers. They can tell you about different um, 
you know, treatment options that might be available to you. What they don't do is say, oh, we've secured a bed for you at this treatment facility. So that would be something that a person works out um, with their insurance. But they can say, here's what's available to you um, as po potential resources, if I have that correct time. Yeah, all yeah. outpatient resources. All so if outpatient, they're requiring yeah. a higher level of care, unfortunately, we're a helpline and resource referral mm -hmm. line. Um, so inpatient services are beyond our scope. But right. I certainly think we can talk people through um, how to maybe call your insurance company and right. figure out what they would cover for those services or where else you could kind of look for things if we're not the right place to start. That's right. That's great. Um, kind of last question, if we don't have more to talk about. Um, myths and preconceived notions. This mm -hmm. might be something that either, I would say maybe any age might have, whether you're you know, in a school age student um, calling or an elderly uh, resident calling, what are some of the um, myths that you want to kind of bust for us when mm. it comes to calling uh, a referral service such as Interface? Wow, we could have a whole yeah. <laughs> uh, spotlight just about that. I think, you know, there's so many myths around mental health, um, which is why it's great that there's an awareness month and there's all of this information. Um, I think that one of the big myths for young people that we, um, I feel like, you know, we talk a lot about and we, we kind of bust that it's a two-parter. Uh, the first part is that once you go into therapy, you're going to be in therapy forever. So now that becomes a part of who you are, right? I'm a person who goes to therapy. Some people enjoy long-term therapeutic relationships, and that's fine. But that does not mean that if you meet with a therapist around an issue, that you will now be someone who has to go to therapy, you know, forever. It, you can, many people utilize therapy in a really short-term mm -hmm. way. So they say, I have this specific thing going on. I'm going to meet and talk to somebody maybe a couple times, maybe a handful of times, and then I feel like that's resolved, and I'm done for now. And and if I ever need something, I can call back. And that's a great way uh, to utilize that for a lot of people and really important to know. Um, I think especially as you're thinking about who you are mm -hmm. and how you have, you know, how you, what your identity is. It's important to know that it can be what you want it to be. And along those same lines, another myth is that you kind of get who you get. Mm -hmm. And so one of the big things we talk to kids and families about is that Therapy is a little different. You know, what I say to young kids is, it's not like if you were at school and you didn't like your t English teacher and you said, well, I don't like this teacher, I want another one. People might not like that, right? And that <laughs> might not work. But it's different with a therapist. You have to find somebody that you really trust and that feels like you have a connection. Um, because otherwise, it won't feel good to do the work that you have to do. Um, and so I think it's really important for young people, but for anyone who's looking into mental health services to realize that it's great to have a few options. And I love the interface provides that because you can meet with someone and they might be very nice, but they might just not be a good fit for you. And any, uh, you know, good therapist is going to recognize that if you tell them, you know, this just isn't working for me. They're going to say, oh, okay, because there's other people out there who they are a good fit for. And they'll just say, well, how can I help you get to a resource that does work for you? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really important to know. Those are great. And I just think yeah. the other one is that um, we get a lot of calls from the school. Mm -hmm. um, and people sort of sometimes think, oh, yeah, you, you do the kids, you know? Oh, and right. it's really a lifespan. Mm -hmm. So we find providers throughout the lifespan and for people to feel that they can access us even though they're not child or calling about their child. Um, the other piece would be just that many people struggle with mental health issues or struggles, situational, mm -hmm. ongoing, and that when we look around, you know, someone recently said to me, uh, you, us, them, Hmm. And I said, that's because it's all of us. You know, it's, it's not, it could be me who's having a struggle. It, sorry. It could be you. It could mm -hmm. be anybody. Absolutely. So I think we know a lot of people who are struggling. We may be struggling ourselves and sort of, sort of think about it as being way over there. It's more around us and within us than, than mm -hmm. we're aware. And that helps reduce stigma, I think, when we think about it being people we know, people we're friends with, mm -hmm. ourselves versus some outside entity. I Absolutely. Agree. And I think I just want to add on to the point that Tanya made about um, it not just being for children. And so I think that as a department in the town that serves children and families, that's our focus. But what we realized and part of what drew us to looking into Interface and you know uh, bringing it to Westwood was that we would often get calls from families um, or for young people who were in their 20s, you know, or folks who were adults. Um, and 
feeling like they needed services and they knew we provided mental health resources and they were just looking and so we were trying to get them connected and running into all those same barriers um, that we described earlier and so we really saw the need um, for people who were not children and adolescents, people who were beyond that. And so we were so glad to be able to bring something that can serve that population because it's absolutely right. Um, people need support throughout the lifespan. It is not just for children and families. And um, we see in the statistics, you know, that the data that just talks about ages of people who might call that more and more people um, in the adult years are using the service and that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. That is great. Mm -hmm. Tanya, anything to add? I don't think so. <laughs> Tanya, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you very much. We'll be right back with Danielle Sutton and Sarah Baroud. Hi, my name is Danielle Sutton, and I'm the director of the town's Youth and Family Services Department. And my name is Sarah Baroud, and I'm a Youth Services Counselor in Westwood Youth and Family Services. My name is Nina Banozik, and I'm a Youth Services Counselor at Westwood Youth and Family Services. My name is Mary Ellen LaRose, and I'm the Administrative Assistant here at Westwood Youth and Family Services. Westwood Youth and Family Services supports the healthy development of children between the ages of 4 and 18 years old and their families. The Youth and Family Services Department came into existence in 1986 when a group of Westwood residents uh, had concerns about supports that could be in place for children and families, and they formed the Westwood Youth Commission. And since 1986, the Youth Commission has grown into the Youth and Family Services Department, and we have a variety of programs here in town. Westwood Youth and Family Services offers three broad categories of service to Westwood residents. The first are free counseling services for individuals, families, and parents. The second part of what we do is resource and referral. So if a family is in need of something that we don't offer here in our offices, we can help them connect to those resources wherever they might be. Some examples of reasons that parents would reach out to us specifically would be maybe if uh, them and their partner are going through a divorce and they're at the beginning stage of that process and they don't really know how to introduce this whole idea to their children, uh, they might reach out to us for some guidance around that. Or if their child is being bullied at school and they feel like they don't know how to explain uh, what's going on to their child, we'd be happy to help there too. And lastly, we offer a variety of programs that we would call community building or preventative programming. And that looks like our social skills groups for young children, girls groups, groups for parents, as well as mentor programs where we connect high school age students as volunteers with younger students in the community. Westwood Youth and Family Services offers structured play groups. These are social skills groups for children in town in grades kindergarten through fifth grade, boys and girls. It's a great way for kids to meet new friends or strengthen relationships and also learn uh, more about social skills. Westwood Youth and Family Services currently offers five mentor programs that high school students can get involved in. These are body safety theater, bullying prevention theater, Friends Network, Thurston Middle School Dances, and the Dove Club. We call it the Mentor Program because our students volunteer with younger students and become role models through their experiences. Westwood Youth and Family Services offers girls groups for girls in Westwood uh, in fourth through sixth grade. In our girls groups, we focus on uh, topics that are specific for girls in grades four through six. So this would include body image, self-esteem, um, safe navigation of social media, friend groups, things like that. A Westwood family that wanted to be in touch to take advantage of these free counseling services could simply call and speak to one of our clinicians or make an appointment to come in and speak with one of our clinicians. And then we would move forward in the process of setting them up with um, the appropriate services. Westwood Youth and Family Services is located at 288 Washington Street, right on the corner of Washington and East Street in the Islington Community Center. We also have a satellite office located in Westwood High School to make uh, visits more convenient for high school age students. Welcome back. Um, we are here with Danielle Sutton and Sarah Baroud um, from Youth and Family Services of okay. Westwood. Um, so, Danielle, 
tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about yourself. Um, how long have you worked in Westwood and what motivated you to become a licensed therapist and ultimately the director of Youth and Family Services? Sure. So I came to Westwood in 2004 as the youth services counselor for the Youth and Family Services Department. And it's hard to believe that it's been that long. Um, but I started off in 2004 and then came into the director role in 2009. Um, and that was just a natural evolution. Um, and I was really glad for the opportunity uh, to keep working in Westwood and working with the children and families in the community because I think um, it's really a privilege to be in a community that focuses on the mental health and overall health of children and families to such a degree. And I came into being a licensed therapist um, because I just always had a passion for working with children and families and I saw what a difference it could make for young people to have someone working with them and with their families to open up lines of communication and solve some of those problems that can get in the way of healthy development. Sarah, same question. Sure, so I uh, became involved in social work after uh, volunteering through AmeriCorps in Philadelphia. I had some experience doing that and it really sparked my interest in working with families in need and, and learning more about mental health. So I went back to graduate school and um, did some work after that doing in-home counseling with families um, in the Metro West area, which I loved, and then saw this position open in Westwood and was really excited to learn how mental health operates in a community setting, and it's been wonderful. And I came to Westwood in 2014. Great. Okay, so for those who don't know, I sure. assume most do at this point, <laughs> but for those who don't, yeah. please tell us a little, about, a little bit about where Youth and Family Services um, offices are located and mm -hmm. what kind of services you offer and maybe some of the programs that you had this past school year. Um, sure. Daniel? I can take the first part okay. um, and just say that the Youth and Family Services Department has been a part of the town since 1986 um, when it was founded, which is, um, so we're coming, this is the 30th year, just coming uh, onto that, which is great. Um, and we the department um, is there to support the healthy development of children and families between children between 4 to 18 years old um, and their families and they do that through what I like to think of as three major you know avenues um, the first is with free um, and confidential mental health counseling for children of those ages um, and also parent consultation for parents or guardians of children those ages where someone might want to talk about how to manage certain behaviors or manage certain situations um, at the parent level. So we can talk about that. That's the first part. The second part is really um, all of our community building and preventative programming. And I'll let Sarah talk a little bit more about those programs, but everything from social skills groups to volunteer programs, um, things that really engage young people in their community and connect older um, kids in the community with younger kids for um, role modeling and mentoring. And then the last part of our services is what I would think of as a resource and referral. So that's just residents contacting us because they might have a mental health question or a question about child development or a question about resources of some kind for their family and they're just not sure where to go. We can be um, do some of that legwork and help connect them to the things that they need. Sounds like a wonderful resource. Sarah, yes. a little bit about maybe some of the programs that are being offered? Sure, so we have uh, six mentor programs, which uh, like Danielle said, connect high school students, grades nine through 12, to younger residents in Westwood. So um, some examples of those programs are two theater programs. One is bullying prevention theater and one is body safety theater. And um, the high school students rehearse for months on end, getting these skits ready to perform for sixth graders is about bullying and for third graders is body safety. Um, we finished our bullying prevention theater program in January of this year and we are just about to do our performances for body safety theater May 9th and 11th for all third graders in Westwood. Um, other programs that we run are um, a one-to-one -one mentoring program with high school students and elementary age kids. We also have some volunteer opportunities at the Westwood Public Library. That's been a great new collaboration. Um, and then we also have structured play groups. So these are for younger kids, um, grades kindergarten through sixth grade. And they promote the um, social skills, team building, positive peer interactions for kids in those grades. And those will run again um, next year, starting in September. Great. Um, I know that you know, there are also programs for um, college-age students 
who might be watching, um, <laughs> and how did they how they can get involved, whether it be an internship or a mentorship. Um, <clears throat> speak a little bit to those students who are looking for that opportunity. Sure. So we have for over. Um, two decades now, had a graduate internship program where we pull from local schools of social work and each year we have at least two graduate interns who are studying counseling um, or social work and they are able to practice and work with children and families in the same way that Sarah and I and our other counselor uh, Nina do but under our supervision just the way a resident would practice uh, in a hospital setting um, and so we welcome those graduate interns each September and they stay with us through the end of the Westwood school year, so the end of June, um, and they are able to really allow us to expand our service offerings at no cost to the town. So working within um, our financial parameters, we're able to nearly you know, double the amount of service um, as we're a staff of three, and with the graduate interns, we become a staff of five clinicians. That's so great. it's a great program, and it also, I think, is great to have an internship site that um, is really able to offer everything that we think um, students need mm -hmm. to thrive and to grow in their clinical practice. So being able to have learning opportunities, having supervisors um, right on site who are there um, with any questions that they might have. That's great. Mm -hmm. Anything else that maybe the residents don't know about Youth and Family Services <coughs> or need to know hmm. about Youth and Family Services? Well, I think that, you know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and it's just a really nice time to be able to come in and talk about the fact that Westwood has its very own mental health resource department uh, for children and families. I think that's a really great thing. You see that in approximately 60 communities in the whole Commonwealth, and Westwood is one of them. Uh, and I think that that's an amazing resource uh, for the families here. So we're just glad to talk about it and find it really timely um, that it's Mental Health Awareness Month. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much to the both of you for joining us today. Thanks, Thanks for Melinda. having us, Melinda. Bye. To find more information about Youth and Family Services programs, please visit www.townhall.westwood.ma.us and click on Town Services. There you will also find a direct link to Interface Referral Services. Are you interested in being a guest on our program? If so, please contact me at this email address. We hope you join us for future episodes of Westwood Media Monthly. I'm Melinda Garfield, and from all of us here at Westwood Media Center, thank you for watching.